Well, good morning, church. It is great to see you today. I want to say welcome to our online campus. Those of you that are joining us on the other side of the screen, however you might be joining us, it's great to have you. If you're on Facebook Live or you're on the live stream at the website or even through the app, there's a couple places there where we have a comment section. 
uh, or a chat area where you could go in. If you would just go in there right now and just say hello to uh, our team that's online with you. We have Stephen ministers and members of our pastoral staff who are online right now and can answer any questions you might have or just say hello to you. That'd be a great thing to do. If you'd like to take communion as a part of your worship experience with us this morning, uh, you can grab those elements if you're at home at this time, and we'll let you know when it's time to partake. If you're in the room, it is awesome to see you. You passed the communion elements on your way in today, and so if you want to partake of communion in just a few moments and you forgot those, you can make your way back there and grab them uh, at this time. It's so great to see uh, some folks that are starting to get back. You know, we got some winter visitors that are already coming back, and those of you who have you felt comfortable now to get back in church in person. It is great to see you and great to have you. Would you stand with me? Let me challenge you as you stand this morning as we enter into worship. Would we just give God the best part of our week right now as we worship together? God bless you. Uh, let's lift up the name of Jesus together today. Sing this with us now. I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. And you came along.
this soul can be As we worship this morning, I'm just not sure if you've caught it, but that's the scene for all of eternity. We get to eternity, that's it. For the rest of time, we get to sing and we get to worship and we get to be with God. Holy, holy, holy. Even if that's all we can conjure in that moment for the rest of time, it, the Bible tells us that's what the angels sing just around the clock right now at the foot of of Jesus and God the Father and the Holy Spirit for the rest of time. Just want that to get in your spirit this morning. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we just worship today. With everything that is happening in the world around us, we're not sure what else to do. So we worship. We pray and we lift the name of your son, Jesus, and proclaim him on high today. So for those that have come into this place and we're just heavy with burden today, I pray that the Holy Spirit would come and comfort as only he can. That he would whisper to our heart and that he would still our soul, calm our nerves, speak to us, encourage us, remind us that in all of the uncertainty, you are there. Our hearts are heavy today for people who are dealing with fires and the consequences of them all across the West, from first responders to people who have lost their lives, to the loved ones that are left behind, to the people that have lost everything. We would just say in this moment, we don't get it. I don't get it, I don't understand. Yet despite that, we're confident that you're there. So we pray that even now, people who are having a difficult time managing that and getting through that, would you just, would you just speak to their soul? Would you just speak to their heart that they might feel your peace and your comfort? Pray for our nation. Lord, we would just ask that we would pick up Jesus before we pick up a political platform or a social platform that we would just pick up the message of Christ carry that with us that through heart change you would do a miracle in our country that we would be the leaders that would help that so just minister to us so that we might do what you would have us to do pray that you would have your way in this place speak to us today and we pray it in Jesus name Amen. Amen. As we continue to worship, we're going to move into a time of prayer and communion. So if you're here and you'd like to pray with someone, we have Stephen ministers that are available in the back. They have on a blue lanyard or a blue name badge, and they're called and trained and ready to pray with you. So whatever your need is, would you just make your way back there as we sing in just a moment and, and allow them to pray with you? If you're watching as a part of our online campus, our Stephen ministers are available in the chat areas and the comment areas as well. If you'll just tell them you have a prayer request, they'll give you instructions on where to go so you guys can have a chat and pray together as a part of our online campus. If you'd like to take communion as we worship today, now would be the time to do that. God bless you this morning.
your well with my soul. Well with my soul. Amen. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Love worshiping with you. Thank you, Pastor Brad and team. Um, before we go any further, I want to just bring a couple of uh, announcements your way. Uh, the first of which is if you're a guest with us, we want to say thanks for being here. Thanks for joining us. Maybe you're new to us in the last uh, month or so or even a little bit longer. Either way, we want you to know that we want to serve you as best we can. And if you'll go and see Pastor Janelle and her team at the Info Center immediately following service this morning, they got a small gift for you and want to figure out how to answer any questions that you might have so we can better serve you. There's many things that are happening at the Info Center today that you can register for events and get information. A couple of them are these. The first is that small group connection event is tonight. And if you are not a part of a small group or maybe you want to trade yours in, this is the event to do it, okay? We want to make sure that everybody is a part of a small group in this church. And so it's available in two different forms tonight. If you'd like to be a part of that via Zoom, you can do that. Or it'll be here on campus in person. We want to make sure to get you connected. You can see Pastor Janelle and her team for registration for that. Next Sunday is Baptism Sunday. If you have not made the decision uh, to be baptized, we want to celebrate that with you. And we want to uh, partner with you as you make that decision. So here's the process. You tell us you want to be baptized, and we'll baptize you. Really easy. We want to celebrate that with you. It's a big Sunday for us. That's happening next Sunday. I also want to remind you that if you want to continue to give as we receive tithes and offerings, uh, there's collection boxes in the back, or you can do that securely at ovcn.church or through the OVCN app, whichever you'd prefer. This time, I'm going to tell you why this good-looking group of people is standing up here looking at you. Pastor Craig, come this time. Did anybody notice this group of people up here? They just kind of snuck up and said, we're going to stand here and you are going to recognize us. Hey, the reason that they're here is because we need their help. God has called us to do something great. We need more people to help us. And God has graciously brought us 50 people that are going to join our church today. And we celebrate that. Would you just give them a great round of applause and say thank you? Mm -hmm. A couple of weeks ago, we had a membership class, and uh, we had some people live, and we had some people through Zoom, and that was great. That was awesome. But you were there, and we went through, uh, boy, it seemed like it was hours upon hours upon hours. It was rugged, and, and uh, then we shared a meal together, and it was a great time. It was a lot of fun. But I have two questions I told you I was going to ask you, and the first one's this, and it's by far the most important question. And that is, has there been a time where you've said yes to Jesus, Jesus, come into my life, forgive me of my sins, and from the best I know how, from this point on, I want to follow you, Jesus, what you did on the cross, you paid for my sins. If you've come to that point in your life where you've said yes to Jesus, would you just say, yes, I have? Yes. Awesome. That's great. You said it with smiles on. I know you did it. That's great. And then the second question is very simple. Listen, there's lots of grace that we have in our church. People come from different backgrounds, and we love that. We think that makes us stronger. But here's what I know. There are nine things that we want you to believe in with us, have unity with us. And there are things about who God is, who Jesus is, who the Holy Spirit is, what the Bible says. And, and, and so there's some basic things that we do want you to believe. And we went over those nine things. If you believe those nine things, would you say, yes, I do? Awesome. Great. Now, I got to tell you, this is really exciting to me because we have 50 people up here, but we also have, this is great. If you're in this service, 930 service, we have our ASL community that sits right over here, and we have LaDonna and Shelly that kind of lead that, and they help uh, do the signing. And so we have six people from our ASL community that are joining our church today. And I think that's awesome. Don't you? Yay. <laughs> So here's what I want you to do today. It, here's the, I asked LaDonna, I said, what's the official sign for, yes, we accept you into our church, we love that you're members at OVCN, and LaDonna says it's this. 
So if you accept these people as members of our church, including the AS, wonderful ASL people, would you go like this and yay, I love it. That's great. That's universal. God bless you guys. Thank you so much. We'll do it one more time. First and next service, okay? So come by and back for that. God bless you. One of the great things that we do in our church is we ask our members, because we want to check if they're committed or not, we ask them to come to all three services. <laughs> that's a pretty big commitment. That's good stuff that they're here. I love that. I think that's such a neat thing. Hey, I was, as I was kind of closing up on my preparation last night for this sermon, I thought to myself, you know what? Today's a perfect day that if you've never asked Jesus Christ to come into your life, today's the perfect day for that. And, and so I want to give you a heads up right from the start that at the end of the service, I want to give you an opportunity. If you've never said yes, hey, if you've never come to this point where you said, Jesus, when you died on the cross, you died for my sins at the end of the service today, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. Because here's what the Bible teaches, that as we explore our faith, and we think that that's, that's really important, as we learn about our faith in Jesus Christ and we try to figure it out. There's usually that moment, not when we have it all figured out, not when we have all of our doubts taken care of, but the Bible says there's usually that kind of clicking thing that goes on in our mind where we finally get it and we go, Jesus, what you did, you did for me, yes, come into my life. I, and I got to tell you, I get excited because I remember the time when I was at a, a, a camp as a child and I said yes to Jesus Christ. Any, do you remember when you said Yes. There ought to be a smile on your face right now because that's when God came down, put his Holy Spirit in your life to help you live for him. And, 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 and there ought to have been change. And for many of you, you've been coming to our church for a while and, and maybe you've been reading your Bible. Maybe you came to the Alpha class that we had, the small group class that we had third, uh, Wednesday night. Wednesday, I'm not sure if you know this, we had 70 people that were part of our uh, 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 class, Alpha class here at our church. Come on, that's incredible, isn't it? That is so cool. But maybe in your life, there's never been that moment when you said, hey, I'm placing my faith in what Jesus Christ did on the cross as payment for my sins. And so at the end of the service today, I just want you to know ahead of time, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that. Today, we're coming to the end of our series, our three-part series on Back to the Basics. And if you'll take your notes out, your, your, uh, your bulletin, open it up. Well, I want to welcome those people that are watching online or those people that are watching in our third space. It's great to have you here. I, I say third space, and that includes, did you know that we also have out on the back patio, we have an 80-inch TV. It's half uh, this service and half the football game. So, yeah, I heard somebody say, you're a liar. <laughs> Only on, I'm just joking. So, hey, I was raised as a preacher's kid, and uh, I, I would, one of the things that my dad taught me early in my life, he said, Craig, when you're praying, add this to your prayer. God, show me your will for my life. Simple prayer. God, show me your will for my life, for, for, for where you want me to go, what you want me to do, for my relationships, all, at every level of your life. God, show me your will for my life. Would you say that prayer out loud with me right now? God, show me your will for my life. It's a great prayer. My dad told me stories like the story of Samuel. Incredible story where God called Samuel's name and Samuel kept on waking up and going into Eli and, and saying, what do you want? And, 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 and it's just God spoke to him. And, and, and when I heard, first heard that story, I'll never forget as a kid, it scared me to death. And I, I, I remember telling my dad, God, I said, dad, I, when God says my name, I'll, I'll say, God, show me, but I don't want to hear God's voice. Anybody with me in that? That would just scare me to death. And, and, and my whole life I've been praying this basic prayer, God, show me your will for my life. And to be honest, there, there's been some chapters in my life 
and maybe you can agree with this, where I didn't pray that prayer. And I'll tell you why. It's because I thought I already knew what God was going to tell me, and I didn't want to hear what I thought God was going to tell me. Anybody with me? There's been chapters in your life where you just went, I, I don't want to hear what God has to say. And, and, and I think you know what I'm talking about. There's those times where I want to do what I want to do, and you don't dare pray that prayer because you're afraid that God's actually going to tell you. But the majority of my life, I was raised to pray, to pray this prayer, God, show me your will for my life. Where should I go to college? What should I major in? Uh, is, is she the one? <laughs> I, remember, I remember when I, I was dating Robin. You, you know when you're a junior in college, you start to pray that prayer, is she the one? Guys, come on, we pray that prayer a lot, don't we? Come on, we want to know, is, is that, God, is that the one you have for me? And, and, and I remember going on a date with Robin one night, and, and I went over and, and knocked on her house door, and, and uh, she lived with her parents at the time, and I knocked on her house door, and, and she opened the door, and when I looked at her, I, in fact, a couple weeks ago on our 35th anniversary, I, I, I looked at her, and I said, I knew exactly when you opened up the door that night that you were the one that God had for me. And I, she said, why? I said, because you had this angelic glow about you. Have you and I, you say, you're joking. No, I'm telling you the absolute truth. When I looked at her, I went, oh, she's the one. I knew. But my point is this. This is a powerful prayer to pray. And I believe that God has a plan and a purpose for your, a will for your life. And you read the Bible and you read about people like Moses. Moses had this incredible experience. He had this, uh, this bush. He's out in the desert and there's this bush that, that starts to just burn and it catches on fire. And God spoke through that burning bush. And then if you go to the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, he was blinded by light, knocked off his donkey, and God began to speak to him. Jesus was like right there. And, 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 and I, I've never had one of those. Have you? And you know what? Even if you're not a Christian, I began to think about this this week. Even if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, come on, this is a powerful prayer for you just to say. I mean, come on. If there's not a God, you're just saying it into the wind. So it's no big deal, right? But I think it's a powerful thing, even if you don't believe in God, just to say, God, show me your will for my life. God, I, I, you know, I feel like a novice. God, I, I'm just trying to figure this out. But God, I'm turning my attention toward you. Would you please show me your will for my life? Powerful, powerful prayer. Now, you know, this is uh, extraordinarily important because your life is essentially the sum total of the decisions that you've made in your life. Think about that with me. Your life is a sum total of the decisions you've made in your life. Some of them good decisions, some of them bad decisions, but your life is all about the decisions you've made. And, and I, I thought about that this week, and I thought, w wouldn't it be fun to go back and undecide some things in life? Hey, could you go back, you know, when you were 22 or 25, and you could undo some of the, undecide some of those things, maybe where, where you went to school or what your major was. What, and what if your whole life, you, what if your whole life you'd just been praying this basic prayer, you've been praying whatever else you pray, but you would add on to that, God, I know what my parents want me to do. And God, I know what society wants me to do. I, I know what I want to do. But God, what do you want me to do? And I want to know your will for my life because my life and your life, there are some total of the decisions that we make. And here's the great news. God has invited you to call him Heavenly Father. When you pray, do you pray like that? I love starting off and just starting off my prayers and going, my heavenly father, come on. Does it get any better than that? That's good stuff. God is inviting you to call him father and, and he knows what's best for you. So why wouldn't you ask God, show me, heavenly father, show me your will for, he knows. God, show me your will for my marriage. Show me your will for my children. Show me your will for my career. My, uh, many people now are unemployed. And for my unemployment, for my employment, my, my, my next employment, for my years in retirement, for, for my years in college, God, I want to know your will for my life. 
In fact, here's what I found. If you look up now, and there's all kinds of searches you can do now. Uh, there's a Bible app. Uh, uh, the, uh, I can't think of the name of it, but it, we, we use it all the time here in our church. And uh, version is what it's called. And you can go and you can just type in God's will or the will of God. And you can find all kinds. There's dozens of these passages of scripture that talk about God's will. And, and you read them back to back to back. And here's what you'll discover as you get into God's word and read about God's, what's God's will. And, and and, 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 and here's what you're going to find. There's three really neat categories that it kind of falls, God's will falls into. And I, I made these words up. They're not, they're not biblical words. But essentially, the, the, the will of God falls into three categories. And I'm going to show them to you real quick. Here's the first one. It's the providential will of God. And the second one is the moral will of God. And the third one is the personal will of God. Leave those three up there just for a second. Look over here at these, study them. Of those three, which one are we most interested in? Yeah, the personal will of God. I, Craig, I don't really care about the providential will of God or the moral will of God. What I really want to know is, you know, do I ask her or do I not ask her? I want to know what God's will is for my personal life. But three categories right there. And here's what's real clear. Leave, leave that up there just for a second. The clearer you are on the first two, the providential will of God and the moral will of God, the easier it's going to be for you to discover the third one, which is the personal will of God. All right, so let's talk about them real quick. If you have your notes, I put them right there in your notes. Here's what I want to say about the providential will of God. This is what God is going to do, and you can't do a thing about it. I, it you know what it's like? It's like the father who has the remote, and I have the remote, and ain't nothing you're going to do about it. First service looked at me like I didn't know what I was talking about. But come on, fathers, when we have the remote, we're going to watch what we want to watch. Anybody say amen to that? Oh, man, you guys are way too easy, man. What, what wonderful dads we have here. So sometimes God says this. God does that. He says, I'm God, and this is the way it's going to be, and this is what, how it's going to happen. And in the Bible, there's all kinds of examples of that. There's one time where God decided to call a guy in the Old Testament, a guy by the name of Abraham. Maybe you've heard of him. And he said, through you, Abraham, I'm going to build this great nation. Not a thing anybody could do about it. God's going to do it. And then God decided to raise up the nation of Israel, and they became like a representative, an example in ancient times of, hey, these are God's people, and this is the God they serve. And there wasn't a thing anybody could do about it. And then God decided that through this nation of Israel, that he was going to bring the Messiah, Jesus, his son, he was going to bring him into the world, and there wasn't a thing anybody could do to stop it. Amen? Amen. Come on, this is, he, he predicted it all the way back. You take your Bible out, you go to the first book of the Bible back in Genesis, and he says, you know, people come, people go, nations rise, nations fall. I, I, I have the remote, God says, and, and this is what I'm going to do because I'm God. And then Jesus came and he died on the cross. He, he rose from the dead and Jesus said, okay, now let me tell you what else God is going to do. God is going to start this thing called the church. And there was about 100 people standing around Jesus when he said this. He's standing on a hill in Judea. And Romans hated Judea. It was like the armpit of, 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 of the world. And they didn't want to ever have the assignment to go to Judea. But Jesus is standing on a hill in Judea, about 100 people standing around him. And Jesus says, let me tell you what's going to happen. We're going to start this, all of us 100, we're going to start this movement called the church. And the gates of hell can never stand up against it. And there ain't a thing, I'm not sure he said ain't, <laughs> better back up. There's not a thing anybody can do about it. <laughs> I know some English teachers always write me and go, don't use ain't. And all these people, the hundred people are looking at Jesus and they're going, are you serious? You're getting ready to go. You're getting ready to leave. And, 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 and we're going to do What? And Jesus says, yeah, I, I want you to go into every nation of the world. And they're going, we're not, we're not even allowed to leave the city. And Jesus says, I want you to go into every nation of the world and preach the good news that I've given you. But see, here's the thing. In God's providence, don't miss this, the church was launched. And there's not anything anybody can do against it. 
Listen, it's going to happen. And people have tried to stand in the way. And here's what we learn in history. Every time somebody stands up in front of God's providential will, God mows them right over. God just keeps on going. Let me give you some examples. Pharaoh, Old Testament, tried to stand up in front of the providential will of God. Moses said, hey, Pharaoh, let my people go. And Pharaoh stood up and said, I'm large and in charge. No, you're not going anywhere. And God said, okay, you watch this. A few months later, Pharaoh called Moses to come in and begged Moses to take the nation of Israel and leave. You can take our wealth, just leave. You know what that is? The providential will of God. God's going to do it. You can't stop it. King Saul, Old Testament again, first king of Israel. King Saul wanted his son Jonathan to be the next king. And God said, no, I've already anointed David as the next king. And Saul said, I'll take care of that. I'll just kill David. And somebody needed to go to Saul and say, hey, Saul, listen, buddy, you really don't want to stand in front of the providential will of God. The Messiah is going to come through, David. Saul, you can't stop what God says he's going to do. Amen? Come on. And you go to the New Testament in the Bible and Saul later become Paul. Different Saul than King Saul in the Old Testament. Saul helps launch the church. And Saul, and Saul before that, though, Saul decides, hey, crazy bunch of Christians, they're trying to run the, you know, hijack the Judaism and, and, and talk about Jesus after we already killed them. And so Saul goes to the Jewish leaders and says, look, and you give me some money and you give me some soldiers and I will squash this Christian movement, this church movement, this church of Jesus. I'll squash it like a bug. And they said, here's some money. Here's some soldiers. Saul, you go get rid of the church. And so Saul is on his way to arrest the church people, put them out of business, and God comes along, knocks Saul off of his mule, cracks me up every time I read it, falls on the ground, Saul becomes blind, and God says, now what are you going to do? You're just, Saul, you're just wasting your time. You cannot win. In fact, I'm going to turn it around, and I'm going to take you, Saul. I'm going to change your name to Paul, and I'm going to use you to spread the very message you are trying to destroy. I'm going to use you to be the king, uh, key person. And Paul wrote half of the New Testament uh, that we have and, and, and planted churches everywhere. Because you see, I want to tell you, you can't stand in front of the will of God, the providential will of God, and stop it. Anybody say amen? amen. I mean, this is so huge. So here's what I want you to know about the providential will of God. You don't want to get on the wrong side of the providential will of God. Amen? Come on. And it's not that God doesn't love you. He does. It's just that God's got the remote. And God's going to do what he wants to do. And God says, I'm, gonna, I'm God, I, I, I'm in charge, and, and, and I'm going to do what I want to do in some of these cases. Now, here's the great thing about it. You have been invited. This is what I love about talking about God's providential will, is that you and I have been invited to participate in the providential will of God. Every single one of us here today, your participation in this local church, when you give, when you serve, when you show up, when you invest and invite, did you know that when you do those things, you are participating in the providential will of God. It is God's will in this generation and in the whole world hears about the name of Jesus and the people understand the name of Jesus. And in being here and helping out in this church and serving, you get to be a part of that. Come on, I get excited about this. Can you tell? It is God's will in this generation that the church is going to multiply. And Saul later become Paul. He couldn't stop. Nobody can stop it. And, and simply by participating in the local church, you are leaning your resources, your time, your energy into what God is up to in this world because it is God's providential will that the church moves forward. This is why I love the local church so much. This is why we're going to keep on using our influence to make a difference in our community, in our world. It's as if God has given us a baton for our generation in our time, and God's going, look, OVCN, here's the baton. Don't drop it. Right? Come on, because if you drop it, I'll just pick it up and go give it to somebody else. But OVCN, here's the baton, and I'm going to let you... If you choose to, 
play a significant role in what I'm up to in the world. And so we get to be a part of God's... Pro- Think of this. We get to play a role in God's providential will. That's exciting to me. Then the moral will of God. This is the easy one. I'll just talk just a couple seconds about this. The moral will of God is in the Bible. And this is, these are the things, the moral will of God are the things you're supposed to do and you're not supposed to do. It's, it's the will of God, the moral will of God that you tell the truth, right? <laughs> okay, let me, let me ask that again. <laughs> I didn't get any amens. I need somebody to say, yeah, Craig, you're right. It is God's will, God's moral will that we tell the truth, amen? Amen. It is God's moral will that we abstain from sexual immorality. It is God's will that that when somebody hurts you, that you forgive them. It is God's will that you honor your father and mother. This is part of the Bible that sometimes we read these things and we go, we kind of cringe and we duck and dodge sometimes. But I'm telling you, this is the part of God's will that when we get this right, we look back and we go, you know what? My life is better because I followed the moral will of God. And I'm learning to love my wife like Christ loved the church, and our marriage is better. And and listen, when we get this right, life change happens. This is where where we finally say, okay, God, it's difficult, but I'm going to say yes to you. I I know what culture says. I, I know what the people around me say. But God, I surrender myself to what you want me to do, your moral will. Now, here's the thing. And this is kind of what I've been preaching to the whole time. Because remember we said the personal will of God is, that's what we really want to hear, Craig. Well, here's the thing. The personal will of God is always found in the context of God's providential will and God's moral will. Here's the deal. The clearer you are with God's providential will, what God is going to do and you ain't going to stop him, that's the providential will of God. The the clearer you are on the providential will of God and the moral will of God, the easier it is for you to discern what God's personal will is for your life. It just is. And, And the more familiar you are with God's providential will and God's moral will, the easier it will be for you to say yes to God's personal will for you. And this is why. Parents, please listen to me on this one. This is why it's, it's absolutely imperative that you get your children as young as you can get them into a church somewhere where somebody is teaching them about God's, hey, this is what God is up to and you can't stop it. God's providential will. And, and also the church that is teaching God's moral will. Hey, these are the things you got to do and these are the things you can't do because God said this. Because they are going to begin to make decisions in God's personal will for their life and it will be easier for them to discern God's personal will for their lives if they know God's providential will and God's moral will. Anybody say Amen. Come on, the more familiar you are with what God is up to in the world and and, and what God is up to in terms of what, you know, the do's and the don'ts, the rights and the wrongs and how to live your life, it's so much easier. God, it's easier when you go, God, where do you want me to live? And who do you want me to marry? And what do you want me to drive? And how much money do you want me to give? And, And how do you want me to spend my life? And where do you want me to go to college? And all those personal issues that you want God's will, they become so much easier when you have found, when you put them in the context and you been working on, hey, I know what God is up to, God's providential will, and I know what God wants in in, in his moral will for my life. It's also why it's important for you to be in a church where these things are taught. I I meet people all the time that go, you know, Craig, I'm trying to make this decision in my life, and I'm I'm trying, I'm searching God's will, and and I'm looking at them going, hey, listen, the decision you need to make... (laughs) God wrote it 2,000 years ago. It's right here. It's not an an easy decision, not a difficult one at all. It's already covered in the Bible. And they're trying to make this decision. I don't know. I'm not sure. And I look at it and I want to go, whoa, whoa, whoa. God doesn't have to speak to you. God's already written it down. Let me show you where it is. It's right here. And so I'm just telling you right now, and I promise we're going to move on, but let me make sure you catch this. When you get clear on the first two, God's providential will and God's moral will, then God, the, the personal will of God for you becomes so much easier to figure out. Whew. So with that as an introduction, 
This is what I love. I've watched people get up, leave, come back, and they're going, is he still on that point? <laughs> I, I, I need for you to, to catch that because I want to take you to what I think is the most important application of what I've just talked to you about. And I, the whole idea of God, what is your will for my life? Show me your will. I think the greatest application of that is written by a guy by the name of Peter. And if you have your Bible, you have, you have this, 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 this letter that he wrote. And we're really just going to look at six verses because that's about what we have time for. But I want to wrap this up by taking to you to an application of what we just talked about. 2 Peter chapter 3, if you have your Bibles. All the verses are coming up on the screen. All the verses are in your notes. If you want to follow along either way, great, wonderful. But I love it when people bring their Bibles and open them up and circle stuff in their Bibles. Peter was one of the disciples of Jesus. And this meant that he... He spent massive amount of times for three years with Jesus, hearing him teach and, and listening to him. And which, when Jesus left, Peter, he became in charge of the church. If you grew up, we have people that come, up with, come to our church with all kinds of different backgrounds. And if you came to our church with a Catholic background, wonderful. We love that. That's great. If you're here, I, you grew up hearing that Peter was like the first pope. That Jesus said, I'm going to launch my ch the church. And, and Jesus said, Peter, he looks over and he says, Peter, you're going to be the cornerstone. So Peter's like this really important person. So Jesus leaves and Peter starts out helping Paul start these churches. And Peter would write to the churches, kind of like a coach. And, and he would coach him up and say, hey, you got this question. Let me answer it for you. And uh, Peter writes all these letters. We have two of these letters. And, and, and they're creatively named First Peter and <sighs> you guys are brilliant. I love it. We got the smartest church in the world. This is so great. And second Peter, he addresses a question that popped up in the church. First Christians. The question was this. Okay, you're telling us that Jesus is coming back. Hmm. We're not sure about that. Because, see, we look around us at what's going on in our world, and Jesus hasn't come back yet. Come on. Is there something in your life in the last six months? Is there something in your heart that is questioned with what's happened with COVID, which what's happened with, with fires and all kinds, with, with, with truth being turned upside down? Is there not something in your life in the last six months? Has there been some time when you've asked this question, Jesus, are you getting ready to come back? Anybody ask that question? Five of us, great, that's, that's wonderful. <laughs> so Peter writes this letter, and we're jumping into the middle of the discussion. He addresses this issue because people are going, I'm not sure I believe that Jesus is really coming back. Verse 4, middle of the discussion, they will say, Peter's writing, they will say, he's talking about these people that are questioning, where is this coming that Jesus promised? Jesus is, he said he was coming back. <laughs> it's Thursday. He's not back. <laughs> Where is he? And verse four, ever since our fathers died, everything goes on and it has since the beginning of creation. Verse five. But Peter says, they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed. The, the earth and the heavens were created. Everything came into being. And the earth was formed out of water and by water. Here's what Peter's saying. He's saying, hey, I, I, I know you think that time just, just goes on and on and on. And we get that way, right? Sometimes in our world, we just think time has always gone on from the, you know, it, it's always been. And we just kind of look forward and we go, it's always will be. And here's Peter. He's saying, hey, I know that's the way it feels. But you have to remember, there was a time when there was nothing. Come on, we believe that, amen? Come on, there was a time when there was total darkness. That's what Genesis says. And when something came, God formed something out of nothing. So even though it seems like, hey, time's just gone on forever, both back and both forward. 
Peter goes, we know better than that. That's not the truth. It, it, God created, so he started. And, and then Peter goes on, verse 6, and by these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. And Peter's saying, hey, also remember that there was a time where God, God interrupted history. God stepped in. He destroyed everything in the world except for one man and his family. And they're all going, oh, yeah. I remember that story about Noah. We hear it all the time. Noah, yeah, I got that. And so they're thinking, then why hasn't God come? Why hasn't Jesus come back? Why is it that all these things that he promised, why, have, why, hasn't, why haven't they happened? And Peter says, in God's providence, you can't stop it. God is going to come and he's going to interrupt time. In God's providence, you can't do a thing about it. God's got the remote. Time will come to an end. Come on, this is really important. And here's how Peter describes this, verse 7. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire. In other words, let me just stop real quick. For the first time, it was water. Second time, it's going to be fire. They're being kept for the day of judgment. Leave it up there. There is something heavy in my heart when I read that. Anybody else with me in this? They're being kept for the day of judgment and destruction. That makes my heart even heavier. They're being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Peter's going, hey, this is uncomfortable information. Don't get used to what you see around you because once there was nothing and God started it all back at the beginning in Genesis. And at one time, there was this time where the world went crazy and God stepped in. He interrupted time and he, he stopped it and he started it all over. And just because Jesus hasn't come back yet, hey guys, doesn't mean he's not coming back. Because in God's providential will, he is coming back, and there will be a day of judgment. Verse 8, but do not forget this one thing. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. He's going, hey, listen, I know you look at your watches and you get your watches out and you look and, and, and you tap your watch and hey, yeah, you know, maybe, I don't know, for them, maybe they tap their hourglass or their sundial, you know, whatever it was for them. And Peter says, hey, that's the way you measure time. But God doesn't measure time like that. And, and, and then look at this next part. It, this is where it gets so personal. Verse 9, the last verse we're going to look at. He says, Peter says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his. Do you see that, that first word on the second line? I'm going to run up to this and you say that one word. Come on, here we go. I say it out, right out loud. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. promise. Here's what Christians believe. Here's what the Bible teaches over and over, and that God has made a promise. I, I don't know all the details, but God has made a promise that every one of us is going to give an account for our lives, that the heavens and the earth, as we know it, one of these days is going to come to an end. And then the judgment. Verse 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient. Hmm. What is he patient about? That's, that's a good question, right? Patient about, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish. You say, Craig, I don't know what that word perish means. Perish means you die without hope. Perish means that you, you, you die without the promise of eternal life with Jesus in heaven. Perish means you die, and all of a sudden as you're dying, you realize, hey, you know what? I should have taken care of this. I don't know what's going to happen next. Verse 9, our Heavenly Father doesn't want anyone to perish. He loves you so much. He's crazy about you, but he wants everyone. Do you know what God's will is? You know what God's personal will is for your life? It's right here in verse 9. Yeah, but Craig, I, I want to know what car to buy. Craig, I want to know where I'm supposed to live. I want to know what I should do. Okay, we'll get to that later. But if you want to know God's personal will for your life, here's where it starts. Verse 9, our Heavenly Father doesn't want anyone to perish, but he wants 
everyone to come to repentance. Craig, I don't know what repentance means. Repentance means you switch teams. Repentance means you, here's what you used to think about Jesus, but now you see that Jesus, when he died on the cross, he died to pay the penalty for your sins. Repentance means I was going this way. Repentance means I'm going now God's way. Amen? Amen. Come on. God's personal will for you. You want to know what God's personal will is for your life? The starting place, it all begins right here. God's personal will for you is that you would come to a place of repentance. Well, when is Jesus coming back? I don't know. But God has not forgotten. And he's not slow. God is patient. And do you know why he's patient? This is so awesome. <laughs> he's patient because he loves you. And God's personal, this says it right here, God's personal will for you. Step number one is that you would not perish, but you would have eternal life. And meanwhile, in, in the meantime, God has hit the pause button on that judgment thing. But you got to remember, he's holding the remote. And in his providential will, one of these days, he's going to wrap this up. And he's going to interrupt history. And he's going to at some point say, it's all over. I'm coming back. So here's how we're going to close. I just want to give you an opportunity. If you've never said yes to Jesus... How great would it be that on September 13th, 2020, the craziest year of our lives. Anybody agree with me on that one? Come on. How many, don't you think it would be incredible if you've never said yes to Jesus that today you would say, okay, I, I, I still have questions, Craig, doesn't matter. I still have doubts, bring them with you. But today there's something that clicks and in your mind you're going, yeah. That's what I want. In a moment, I want to pray, and I want to give you an opportunity just to, for you to pray where you're, right where you're at and to pray that prayer to God. Yes, God. Second thing I thought of, man, my heart gets so heavy when I think about the judgment of God. And I think about people that play around on the edges of sin and think it's no big deal because time just kind of keeps on going and there's no big deal. It'll be all right. No, 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 no. It is a big deal. Amen? Come on. And I just want to say to people that are just kind of going, living their life and doing what they want to do and they're, they're going, no, God, I don't want to know what your will is for my life because I, I kind of have a good idea what you're going to tell me to do and that today you would just stop. And realize that there is a day of judgment. There's a day of accountability. And that you would just say, God, would you come in and do a revival in my heart? Now, I'm not going to play around with that sin anymore. I'm done with it. And I'm saying yes to you, God. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Come on. Between you and God, this is not, I'm not, I'm not even in this. I'm just kind of helping you out and directing you. But would you just start off and would you just say, Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me. Come on. In your heart, just say that. God, thank you for, for, for being crazy about a relationship with me. And then if you've never said yes to Jesus, come on, right now, this is a great time to do it. Would you just say in your heart right now, just say, Jesus, you don't have to say it out loud. You don't have to come forward. You don't have to stand up. Just right where you're at, just say, Jesus, yes, come into my life. Forgive me for going my way. And Jesus, when you died on the cross, you died for my sins. I believe that with all of my heart. Yes, come into my life. I, I got tons of questions. I, I, I don't know everything. I'm so new at this. But just say the best I know how, yes. And I promise you, if you say yes, he'll come into your heart. 
Now, come on, some of you who have said yes to God and yet you kind of started to do your own thing, go your own way, and you're starting to play with, with, with sin like it's no big deal. Come on, today is that revival in your heart. Today is that thing where you wake up and you go, you know what? There is, there is that time where God's going to step in and he's going to stop this whole thing and there will be a day of accountability. So Jesus, I'm sorry for that sin that I keep on playing around with. And I want to listen to your voice. And so Jesus, this is a new day in my life. I'm walking with you. I'm following you. And for you, you don't have to tell anybody else, but just in your life, Jesus, I'm surrendering myself to you and your will, your way, what you want me to do. Heavenly Father, would you give us the wisdom to know what to do with what we've heard? And then would you give us the courage to do it? In Jesus' name we pray these things. And all God's people in agreement said, amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. I sing this great old hymn with us now. Come now, fount of every blessing, to my heart to sing thy praise. Streams of mercy, never ceasing, call for songs of honest praise. Teach me some melodious song, sung by flame. Jesus song.